spiritual philosophy. It's a healthy sport. And it's an art. Anybody want to be a bodybuilder? But don't nobody want to lift no heavy ass weight. Sad state of bodybuilding, and someone's literally gonna have to die on stage before something changes, like actually seriously. It might be right. Might be right. One of the gold standards of physical fitness is muscular development. An age old means to qualify whether or not one is in good shape, literally. Hypertrophied contractile tissue signals effort, strength, and even beauty. We were all born with a body, but this is not necessarily the body we are stuck with for life. You see, we are all capable of building a body. Ancient civilizations such as India, Egypt, and Greece were all believed to have had cultures that incorporated some form of resistance training as a practice for developing the body in terms of size and strength. But it was not strictly about size and strength alone. The Greeks, in particular, showcased a love for physique aesthetics alongside size and strength in their art, which would go on to inspire some of the greatest works of the Renaissance. But it wasn't until the 19th century when we would begin to see strongman as a sort of organized endeavor. But by that point, the aesthetic sensibilities of the Greeks were mostly lost. Athletes often performed at the circus and were, of course, large and outrageously strong, but they lacked the muscular definition in regards to their body composition. This remained the norm for those pursuing size and strength gains throughout the end of the 19th century. That is, until circus strongman Friedrich Wilhelm Müller blazed the trail that would change the game forever. Now, who exactly is Friedrich, you ask? Well, perhaps you know him better by the name Eugene Sandow the father of bodybuilding. Without Sandow, the pursuit of aesthetics would likely not exist, as he was the athlete and showman to reintroduce the idea of shape, symmetry, and beauty into the size and strength equation. And Sandow did not compromise on ability in service of appearance. He was not only incredibly detailed in his muscular development, but he was also unbelievably athletic and strong, performing feats such as push-ups on one finger, backflips while holding dumbbells, breaking chains around his chest, as well as allegedly wrestling a lion. Accompanying the creation of bodybuilding, Sandow sought to emphasize nutrition and the broad spectrum of health as a part of this newfound pursuit. And society certainly embraced that newfound pursuit, as the first bodybuilding show would follow close behind Sandow's introduction of the sport. In 1901, at the Royal Albert Hall in London, England, countless spectators gazed in bewilderment at the specimens before them. The original competition standards stressed general development, the quality or balance of that development, the condition and tone of the tissues, general health, and even the condition of the skin. Winners would receive what would be about $2,500 worth of prize money, as well as a golden Sandow statuette. After this historic moment, the sport of bodybuilding was officially born. And from that point forward, exercising with weights for strength, size, and aesthetic improvements would rise in popularity. And more and more names would begin to emerge to help with the promotion of the lifestyle, such as a man who is known as the father of physical culture, Bernard McFadden. In his time, McFadden was one of the most successful magazine publishers, whose publications centered around health, fitness, and the main topic of this video, bodybuilding. McFadden sold products and ideas, but one of his greatest contributions to the bodybuilding lifestyle was by staging the first bodybuilding competition in the United States in 1903. It was through both this competition and McFadden's fitness magazines that we were then introduced to one of the most important bodybuilders of all time. Someone that McFadden would go on to dub the world's most perfectly developed man. Before the social media clickbait and false promises of modern fitness ads, we had Charles Atlas. No girl, Jimmy. No, girls laugh at me because I'm skinny. Do what I did. Send for the Charles Atlas book. It explains how in your own room, dynamic tension can add inches to your physique in just 15 minutes a day. Who, though bold in his claims, did a lot for the promotion of weight training. Atlas's ads would go on to appear in a lot of comic books, 
And speaking of comic books, this is also when we would see the creation of the first superhero of all time. You know. This looks like a job for Superman. That guy. And Superman, of course, sported a muscular physique that was reminiscent of the 1930s era of bodybuilding. And since we're in the 1930s, it's important to mention the great Jack LaLanne, who opened the first gym in the United States in 1936. The first one had rugs on the floor, chrome equipment, and so much of the equipment in the gym that I invented, you know, the leg extension machine and the uh, weight selectors, all those things. There was nothing way back there in the 30s, so I had to invent things. Also at this time, the first bodybuilding event was established by the Amateur Athletic Union, or the AAU. This event was originally held in 1939, and the winner would be deemed America's best built man. And the best built man of that initial year was actually two men, Bert Goodrich and Roland S. Maker. But winners of years to follow would be given a different title, Mr. America. Bodybuilding continued to grow in popularity thereafter, so much so that in 1946, the AAU would be faced with a new challenger, an organization created by Canadian brothers Ben and Joe Weider, the International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness, or the IFBB. The IFBB held their own Mr. America competition in 1949, and just one year after that, the National Amateur Bodybuilders Association, or the NABBA, was formed and made the Mr. Universe competition a regular event. With the AAU, IFBB, and NABBA, we would of course gain many incredible bodybuilders. Some of the most successful athletes of the 1940s and 50s were the likes of John Grimmick, Clarence Ross, Reg Park, and of course, Steve Reeves. Reeves truly was one of the most influential titans of bodybuilding. Even though he retired from competition in 1950 at the age of 24, he had a physique that is still considered to be one of the most aesthetic in the sport. Why did he retire then? Mrs. Burns, hmm? take a look at this back. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, there's no sense in my looking at it. With lumps like that, you, you better see a doctor. <laughs> well, likely so he could capitalize on his movie star looks as he transitioned to Hollywood films. Most notably Hercules in 1958 where he played the titular role. Some more? Mm, no, that's enough. I'll begin where your lips ended. I can't decide whether you're sincere or just bold. Reeves' contributions to the sport were instrumental, but the muscled movie star made it out just before one of the most critical turning points in all of bodybuilding. Steroids are taken uh, eight or nine, ten weeks before a competition. It's not a healthy thing to do, but uh, it, it's being used. Did you, did you take them? I take them, I took them, yeah, up until the competition. In the years leading up to the 1950s, scientists were experimenting with synthetic testosterone. Testosterone, of course, helps with tissue repair by increasing muscle protein synthesis in the body. And it should go without saying that this would be more than ideal in terms of taking bodybuilding to the next level. And, for better and for worse, bodybuilding was in fact taken to that next level. Anabolic steroids signaled a monumental shift in terms of bodybuilding standards. And though history is uncertain, it is largely believed that this performance-enhancing drug was not widespread before 1965. What else was going on in 1965? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this is the year in which the most prestigious event in bodybuilding was born. With a title that harkens back to the gods of ancient Greece, one half of the Canadian-born Weeder brothers showcased the Mr. Olympia. American-born Larry Scott was the winner of the first two years of the event, followed by a three-year winning streak by Sergio Oliva from Cuba. And after Oliva's reign, we would then be introduced to another reigning champion. An Austrian with big dreams and a funny accent. The greatest feeling you can get in a gym or the most satisfying feeling you can get in a gym is the pump. It's as satisfying to me as uh, coming is. So I'm coming day and night. <laughs> Enter the age of Schwarzenegger. Arnie collected Mr. Olympia titles from 1970 to 1975, the latter year being the setting for the groundbreaking documentary Pumping Iron, which would premiere in 1977, introducing the world to icons such as Franco Colombo and Lou Ferrigno. Schwarzenegger would briefly retire after that Olympia win in 1975, allowing Frank Zane to step up as a new champion on the Olympia scene. 
Zayn was revered for his methodical approach to the sport, creating what is regarded as one of the most aesthetic physiques of all time. But when Schwarzenegger returned in 1980, for what would be his actual final competition, he was deemed Mr. Olympia yet again, breaking Zayn's then three-year run as the overall winner. The 1980 Olympia would go down as one of the most controversial shows in bodybuilding history, as Zayn had just recently recovered from a life-threatening injury, and Schwarzenegger had only entered the competition one day prior after training for only eight weeks. Regardless of the outcome, both athletes would go down as legends of aesthetics. But of course, when it came to Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. His influence would reach far beyond bodybuilding competition, especially as the 1980s rolled on. You son of a bitch. Similar to how Reeves had a look that Hollywood desired, so did Schwarzenegger. And his physique would set a new standard for action movies going forward. And aside from action movies, we would also see the physiques of cartoon characters, action figures, professional wrestlers, as well as the aforementioned comic book superhero, follow in the footsteps of the standards set by bodybuilders. Unfortunately, another trend seen in the 1980s involved bodybuilders incorporating different types of steroids as well as other performance enhancing drugs, such as HGH and insulin, into the lifestyle. These compounds would be stacked or taken in conjunction with one another, and bodybuilders continue to grow bigger and bigger. Some of the most prolific competitors of this period include Tom Platz and Lee Haney. But the size gains would be kicked into overdrive by the 1990s with mass monsters such as Flex Wheeler, Dorian Yates, and of course, Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> Yates and Coleman in particular pushed the boundaries of size, with Yates competing at 265 pounds and Coleman competing near 300 pounds. Accompanying the push for bigger bodybuilders, we would see a shift from the classic aesthetics of the past towards a much bulkier look. Jay Cutler, Dexter Jackson, and Phil Heath were some of the biggest names in the sport after the turn of the millennium. And we would eventually also see beefcake Olympians like Kai Greene, Sean Roden, and Big Ramy. Outside of the changes in physique standards, the social media fitness movement would also begin in the 2000s, largely with the coming of influencers such as Z's, as well as the advent of YouTube. Content creators such as Scooby1961 is arguably one of the most important figures in the social media fitness movement, because after the launch of his channel in 2006, an influx of fitness fanatics would follow suit. And we would eventually see IFBB Pro bodybuilders with YouTube channels of their own. And going back to the pro scene, changes in physique standards had been a controversial shift, as many felt as though sheer mass had taken precedence over structure, shape, symmetry, conditioning, and other factors that were staples of the golden era of bodybuilding. And I just think in the last 100 years, wow, thanks to commercial considerations, thanks to muscle magazines, we get these bubble guts appearing, we, we have these freaks of nature, which I think some people genuinely like, they want to push themselves to the limit, but is that what bodybuilding is about? And is that what we should be taking away from this lifting journey? This is in part because of how the drugs have ramped up in the sport. As time has gone on, the envelope must be pushed in order to keep the interest of the spectators. Even with the introduction of more toned down categories such as the men's physique division in 2013 and the classic physique division in 2016, bodybuilders would begin to drop dead at an alarming rate. IFBB competitors such as George Peterson and Sean Roden, for example, both passed away in 2021. I got a list of 50 when I, I did a podcast last week with wow. this medical expert and there's 50 pros that I know about. That's just pros. That have died. What about amateurs? What about wow. guys that never compete? As a result of these deaths, many have been pushing for change. I and mean, this is exactly why we see this more among bodybuilders compared to other athletes. They abuse the most PEDs. Human beings are naturally competitive. We want to be the best at whatever we do. However, being the best bodybuilder is not a particularly healthy endeavor and generally speaking it catches up to you eventually aside from the obvious drug issue bodybuilding also tends to promote eating big to get big you know you hear about the food amounts or the drugs or you know you're trying to develop a body i think guys tend to overeat more and i think that's the most dangerous thing honestly and on the other extreme taking their body fat to dangerously low levels for competition and aside from that Bodybuilding can come with a host of mental health repercussions to go along with the physical. And it's not just deaths or early deaths, it's also mental health, 
body dysmorphia, eating disorders, and so on. There are so many negative things happening in bodybuilding, but it isn't necessarily bodybuilding's fault. Even outside of the professional scene, there have been a plethora of celebrities who take on bodybuilding protocols, whether for movie roles or otherwise, who are then forced to be dishonest about how they achieved their results, creating unrealistic standards for consumers all around the world. So, how do they do it? Chicken, steamed vegetables, and occasionally some brown rice or something like that. Brown rice, grilled chicken, broccoli, a gallon and a half of water a day, mm -hmm. and working out two to three times a day, six days a week. It was about nine months of uh, chicken breast and broccoli. I worked out six hours a day, every day, for the last 20 years straight. Chicken. You... <laughs> chicken. Loads of chicken like these. Just bland, naked pieces of chicken. At this point, it should go without saying that the current state of the pursuit of muscular development and physique betterment is in a very, very sad place. When the majority of the world is overweight or obese, those who desire a strong and muscular physique shouldn't be comparable in terms of health to those who are sedentary. Bodybuilding began as a genuine pursuit for health. Now, it is largely anything but. And we're like, hey man, bodybuilding seems to be on the crime scene yet again. Another death in bodybuilding's at the crime scene. It can't be a coincidence anymore. I want to make it clear that I have no disrespect for those who choose to take performance enhancing drugs in pursuit of bodybuilding endeavors, but perhaps it is time for a revolution. If you enjoyed this essay, I encourage you to share it around. I would love to see bodybuilding become something healthy on the whole. Perhaps it is unrealistic to assume that we could recapture the days of Eugene Sandow or Steve Reeves, but anything is better than this. I wish you all health and happiness. Bye bye